Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the BB, BBBC <laughs> 2022. Uh, been a building boot camp. That's a great name. A little hard to say. St. Lawrence Center for the Arts is our project. So let's talk about this. We're going to talk about the lighting. And uh, why am I here? So I'm a lighting designer, consultant, and educator. I've had over 40 years experience as an independent consultant. Um, if you've been to the Royal Ontario Museum or the Rogers Centre or the McMichael Canadian Collection, the Gardner Museum, first Canadian place, you've seen some of my work. If you went to school in, in Toronto, you probably were in a building that I did the lighting specifications for. And my specialty really has been museums and art galleries um, because I have an interest in art and uh, it, I was always attracted to those kinds of projects. Um, but I started in professional theater, so I do know a little bit about these kinds of performance spaces. So I was a technical director, production manager, and lighting designer uh, in theater for the first uh, six years of my career. So what do we have here? So the performing uh, St. Lawrence Center for the Arts is a performing arts theater. It was opened in 1970. It was a Canadian centennial project, which means they started it in 67, of course. Um, it was funded out of that those projects. Um, the key words for this project in the write-up are transformative, creative, and welcoming. And I'm always interested in the words that they put in these things because, you know, they look good on a press release, but nobody ever actually explains what they mean. So what do they really mean? So what makes a space transformative or creative or welcoming? Well, all of these words are um, attached in terms of building design are attached directly to lighting quality. Um, the, the way to look at lighting in, in any project is that um, but one of the great lighting designers of all time had a saying was that light defines space. And that is that the reaction that people have when they walk into the space is going to be determined by the lighting. Think of it without the lighting and the, without the lighting, it's a black box. If you walk in and you do the lighting improperly, it is either too bright, too glary, inappropriate fixtures architecturally, um, incorrect lamp light color, uh, all of these factors uh, will impact people's perception of the space. So if the lighting is done uh, well, then the these words, transformative, creative, and welcoming can apply to the project. Without the lighting done well, it's going to be very, very difficult to achieve uh, those results. So, um, it, it, my point is that it's um, it's it's incumbent on the design team to ensure that the best possible lighting is uh, is used uh, with a focus really on the quality of the lighting. So, one of the other um, issues facing us is that and this has happened over the last uh, 15, 20 years, is that the emphasis on lighting has gone away from lighting quality and almost entirely on energy. So energy saving has become the driver of so many lighting projects. And when I was involved in uh, that industry uh, in the early 90s, um, the the danger was that the way I put it was that you threw the baby of quality out with the dishwasher, out with the dishwater. So the, the idea is that you don't want to uh, lose the, uh, the, qual the quality approach to the lighting in order to save energy. The people in the building, other than the people who pay the bills and the people that own or manage the building, but the people who actually use the building, the people that you're creating this space for is for the audience to come into this theater. They really have no clue what it costs to operate that from an energy point of view, but they really notice if the lighting is done poorly. So the approach that we took when we were doing energy projects was this, improve the lighting quality, make the improvements pay for um, the energy savings, pay for the improvement in lighting quality because what you wanted to end up with was a job you could walk away from that people liked. In other words, people walk into the building and say, this looks really great. And that's the key to a successful building. That, like I say, the, the emphasis has been, has shifted so much towards the energy side and away from the quality. And this is a danger that we're facing today. Um, 
Now, increased use of daylighting, which is a really good measure to use in most um, uh, of the projects that we do, it's not really feasible in a performance space because you really have to have total control over the light in the space. So you can't really have a whole bunch of windows. There is an exception to that. And I'll, I'll, we'll show you some pictures of that later on in the talk. Um, so design factors in performing, art, uh, in performing art spaces are control, flexibility, and ambiance. So control being obviously the key thing because we have to be able to control every aspect of the lighting, not just the lighting in the lobby and the house, um, but also on the stage. Um, the flexibility so that we can have uh, afternoon shows and evening shows and we allow for people's uh, ability to um, adapt from different light levels that are coming in from outside into a lobby in the afternoon. You probably want to have that lobby lit to a higher light level than you would, for example, in the evening because they're coming in with their eyes adjusted to much lower light levels from outdoors. So flexibility is important and ambiance is important. In other words, what does it look like? What does it feel like in this space? Um, energy efficiency is obviously important in all sectors due to the impact on operating costs. However, performing arts spaces have extremely high per square meter electrical use, but only sporadically. So let me explain that a little further here. So here's an example. So the St. Lawrence Center today is, is, is operating and uh, it's open Monday to Friday. The box office rather is open Monday to Friday from one to 6 p.m. That's five hours, five days a week is 25 hours a week. The box office is also open two hours before showtime and closes 30 minutes after showtime for any performance. So on a weekend, for example, if you've got a matinee on Saturday and an evening performance, it's going to open up at around 1230, one o'clock, something like that. It's going to close down between the shows. It's going to open up again around seven or so for an eight o'clock show or maybe six for an eight o'clock show. But let's look at the events. September, there's one, two, three, four, five, and three. There's eight events in the entire month of September. So a performing arts space may have uh, a large electrical usage when it's operating, but not when it's not. So the hours of use, uh, the actual uh, energy cost um, is, is more driven by the hours of use than by the uh, by the actual electrical load, if, I, if you're following me. The, um, a building like First Canadian Place, uh, where the electrical, electrical load is measured in megawatts, um, it's open almost 24-7. There's, uh, I think there's three or four floors of data, data um, banks of computer centers, um, data centers in that, in that complex. They're open 24-7 because they bank, they bank around the world, right? So uh, it's, 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 an, it's a building that not only uses a lot of energy, it uses a lot of energy almost all the time, every hour of the day. Performing art space, that's not the case. So this makes the math, uh, the costing and the and figuring out savings from different measures a little bit more complicated because the hours of use are not a, a, not a significant proportion. So this is also true of sports facilities. Uh, Blue Jays have only 30 home games for the entire season. So the connected load is over a megawatt uh, for, the, uh, for the Rogers Center, but only 30 times a year for that client. And they do have other uses, uh, but keep in mind, they've got a big, big building with a lot of lights, but they're on a relatively short period of time. So this means the energy savings calculations are more complex than for a conventional commercial building or a school or a hospital. Determining the value for a particular energy saving strategy will be a challenge because it's a moving target. So let's take a look at some uh, illuminance levels. Uh, illuminance is the term that lighting designers use. Um, I, I don't know uh, in advance how much lighting training you folks have had, and it's probably maybe a wide range as well. Um, but the, uh, the, the simplest thing or the, the simplest metric that we can use in terms of designing lighting is illuminance. That is how much light is striking the surfaces in the space. It's not what you see. What you see is called luminance, typical of a lighting industry. The terms all sound very familiar and they have completely different meanings. So luminance is brightness. So if you look at a surface and you see how bright it is, you say, oh, that's really bright. That's luminance. That is light that's coming back to your eye. Illuminance is what we design 
and it is the light that's striking the surface. So what comes back to your eye is going to be determined by a number of different factors, the most significant of which is the color of the surface. So if we have a wall that's white or off-white, and the light is striking the surface, most of that light is going to come back to your eye. So it's going to have a high luminance value. But if we take that same wall with the same amount of light and paint it dark gray, there's going to be much less light coming back to your eye. So then it becomes a lot less bright to your perception, even though you're still using the same amount of energy. So the IES, uh, Illuminating Engineering Society, is the organization that determines all this stuff. Um, it has determined luminance levels for all support spaces, such as the lobby, bars, washrooms, seating areas, control booths, dressing rooms, but not the stage typically. And the reason for that is that that's determined by the lighting designer and it's a creative artistic uh, goal. It's not uh, something that has to be achieved one way or the other. Besides which the light level on a stage can be anything from zero to, oh my God, that's bright. So it's, uh, it, it, it's a moving target, right? So the stage lighting is the purview with the theatrical lighting designer and is driven entirely by the artistic requirements of the performance. So the charts for these areas are, found, are to be found in IES RP 41-20, which is called Lighting Theaters and Worship Spaces. This is obviously a US publication. You can tell by the American spellings. So let's take a quick look at this. So this is just one part of pages and pages and pages of these charts. Um, they look at every single aspect of these spaces. Uh, and I've just taken a section here that would apply to uh, the ones we're most interested in. Um, and the way this is divided up is, oopsie daisy, let's try that again, shall we? Uh, the way this is divided up is we have two, um, the, the numbers here, first of all, they're all illuminates. That is the light striking the surface. We have horizontal readings and we have vertical readings. And the reason for the difference is that it's very easy to achieve horizontal illuminance levels because lights typically are mounted on the ceiling and they're pointing straight down. So the floor, the light is going straight down onto a desk or a floor. In other words, a horizontal surface. But the problem is that in those spaces, there are people moving around and we have furniture and we have artwork and we have all kinds of other things going on. And those things are almost all vertical. If you think of a person walking into a space, that person is like a column. They have, a, and you want to be able to illuminate their face. You want to be able to see their facial features. And so that is going to be how well we see those things is going to be determined by the vertical illuminance, not by the horizontal illuminance. And that's determined by a number of factors, mostly related to the photometry or the design, if you will, of the light fixture that's being used. We can put light fixtures in that will put little pinpoint spots of light down onto the floor. They're going to give great horizontal values, but lousy vertical values. Um, anybody who's done that trick where you hold a flashlight underneath your face to scare the living daylights out of your brother or sister, uh, that's what happens when you have just vertical, uh, just uh, um, lights pointing straight down rather than light spreading out to the sides. So let's take a look at this again. Um, here we have uh, uh, three areas that are really applicable here. The dressing rooms, which is here. We have foyers, which are in another part of the uh, thing, which I didn't, I didn't include that. The green room, which is the lounge that the actors or performers relax in. And the house. The house is the uh, generic name for the part of a um, performing art space where the audience sits. So basically everything in front of the stage is called the house. Um, the everything behind that line, in other words, from this, everything that's on the stage is in, is called just stage or and behind that is called back of house. So in the wings or dressing room, stuff like that, that's all referred to as back of house. But house is what we're concerned about because that's where the audience is. So let's take a look at the dressing rooms. There's three class categories, general reading and vanity. And vanity would be the dressing room would have mirrors and a place where the audience, can, uh, where the um, actor or performer can sit and do makeup, that kind of thing. And first of all, our, our areas are driven into, our requirements are driven into uh, lighting levels for areas, which is A here, or task, which is T. So basically this would be an, uh, per, per, per square foot. So over an area. And this would be on a specific task where the letter T is. Um, 
categories, these letters down the side, they're pretty much irrelevant. Uh, in fact, I think they've dropped these out of the latest versions of these, some of these charts. Um, there used to be a, a letter category system, which was very easy because there was only seven letters. Now there's 23 or 24. So it's, uh, most people don't have that memorized. But the, um, so here are the, here are the values. Uh, so we have 200 lux, okay? And it says at 0.76, well, that's uh, approximately uh, three feet, 0.76 of a meter. Uh, or oh, two and a half feet. Here we, they give us that translation. So here's the here's the uh, metric numbers in yellow, and in the pink or purple color here, it's uh, it's the imperial measure. So 200 lux, uh, or 20 foot candles at two and a half feet, and that's average across that area. So that's the way these are set up. Now, I just want to point out. Um, obviously, the reading area is going to be higher because obviously reading is a more uh, visual skill, requires more visual acuity uh, than just walking around in the space. If we go down to the, the, the green room, the green room is much, much lower light levels. And the reason for that is that in a performing arts environment, you want to have your performers adapted to fairly low light levels. Yes, we know they're going out onto a stage where it's going to be potentially very bright, or uh, going to be doing a performance where there's a spotlight on them and it's very bright. However, in order to get there, they have to go through in areas that are quite dark, especially in the wings of the theater, because you don't want them brightly lit. So you want them adapted to a fairly low light level. It's also more relaxing. So in the green room here, we have a general area of only 40. Now look at that, that's five times higher, or sorry, five times lower than we had in our dressing room. And to give you a, a, a metric, an equivalent metric, um, we said we talked about 200 before. Uh, typical offices and classrooms nowadays are generally designed to about 300 to 350 lux. So that gives you a feeling for what that feels like. So we're down here this in our green room. Our general lighting is 40. So much, much less light. Four foot candles. And the reading or sitting area is only 150. Um, so why would you have reading in the green room? Because they might be <laughs> catching up on their lines <laughs> uh, or the uh, the uh, lyrics to a song, um, just checking uh, their their song list or set list. Uh, they, they may have some reading, but all, once again, it's still a very low light level. And then uh, what's key important for us is our house. And as you can see, during the production, we have pre-show, post-show and intermission and aisles. I didn't include the rest of this. Um, well, sorry, let me let me back up. During production, that is while the show is on, there are no horizontal requirements. All the requirements are vertical. And the reason for that, if you think about it, if the show is on, the only lighting in the house in the theater typically is on the performance space. It's on the stage. It's on the performers. It's not in the house. But you still require a little bit of light in the house for safety. If somebody gets ill or they suddenly have to leave the theater, they have to be able to stand up, navigate their way over people's legs and in, into the aisle and walk up the aisle without tripping on any steps or anything. So you do need a little bit of light. And that's what's indicated here. It's only one foot can one lux vertical. Okay. So this is typical of the lighting that would be required for emergency exit in a in a uh in a in a building if you had an emergency situation or a power failure. Uh, you would have to have this much light in order for people to be able to get out without actually tripping over their own feet. And that's very, very minimal uh, about the light level you would have out, outside on a moonlit night, but it's enough that you can see uh, to navigate. That's all that's required. And um, so that's during the show. And then uh, before the show, after the show and during intermission, notice the light levels are considerably higher. We're up around 100 lux. Uh, and aisles are only required to be around 10. So once again, it's a navigation area. Nobody's reading the program or trying to do brain surgery. It's just a matter of navigating your way through the space. So that's the uh, uh, essential uh, information or just some of it that, that the lighting designer would be looking at when they're starting to design lighting for this space. Uh, just to give you a quick overview of what these spaces are likely to look like, um, our first um, uh, drawing here, is of a proscenium arch theater, a proscenium theater, uh, which, is, which is what you would call a conventional theater where you have a stage at the front with an arch over top of it as a curtain that comes down and the audience is in front. And this is typically laid out like this. Our stage area is over here. 
We have some kind of border lights, as they're called, sometimes called strip lights. Uh, they can be floor and ceiling mounted. And the reason they're there is to light the backdrop. So if we have a, either a photographic backdrop like I have behind me right now, or we have a, a curtain that we're going to sh shine projections onto or something like that, or make a, a sun, sunset effect, uh, then we're going to have some kind of border strip. So this is basically um, all the colors in the rainbow um, uh, in a row. And so we can control the color separately and we can create all kinds of effects on there. And then we had overhead, we have lots of pipes with lights on them. There are as many as you can fit in in here. And uh, we also have floor pockets uh, where we have the ability to plug a light into the lighting control system that's down located on the floor. Uh, these are used an awful lot in dance productions. Um, they call ankle busters uh, because you want to be able to light the dancer from their feet up so that they look like they're floating above the floor. So very important, especially for ballet. Uh, we have the curtain indicated here. Here's the edge of our stage right here. Here's our proscenium arch over the stage. And then out here is where the audience is. And there'll be rows of these uh, ceiling coves with lights in them. And there'll also be uh, side slots, which have lights mounted on the side. So you can come in lower angles. It's for good for special effects. And at the back, there'll be some kind of control booth arrangement at the back, and they may have follow spots. Usually our lighting control guy is back here. On touring shows, or people are, are, are traveling with a show, quite often you'll see the lighting console set up in the, in the audience right at the very back. You see that quite often, um, especially in newer theaters, and, um, uh, but especially for traveling shows, because they're usually traveling with more equipment than will actually fit in the, in the typical uh, control booth. So uh, they have it in the audience. Um, for that, for convenience more than anything else. And then if you look at the side view, a section view of that same space down below here, uh, you'll see we've got uh, a control booth. Let me just generally get rid of that. There we go. Um, here we have, once again, here's our stage. Here's our floor pockets. Here's our border light. Can also be located on the floor. Here's our lights hanging above. And here's our ceiling slot or ceiling cove. Uh, with lights. There's usually quite often uh, several of these and side slots as well. Here's our seats. And then here's our control booth back here. Should be pretty straightforward. And then the next one we're going to look at is this guy. And this has got a, um, uh, this is a, a thrust stage. And this is, if any of you have been to Stratford, you will have seen a thrust stage where the stage is actually comes out into the audience area and people sit around it in a semicircle. Um, there's a lot of advantages and disadvantages to this. Uh, advantages, it puts the actor right in with the audience and it's much more intimate. Um, it feels uh, like, and it makes the audience feel like they're more participating. Uh, than a proscenium. A proscenium has more of like a cinema effect where you're sitting there and you're looking at something on a flat screen. This is more three-dimensional, much more difficult to direct for because you've got people moving around in 3D and it's uh, more complicated, much harder to light. Uh, if I've got people sitting over here and I've got lights up here, I have to be really cautious of glare. Uh, so um, it provides a number of challenges, but as you can see, this will have a grid of uh, lights uh, over top of the stage of the thrust stage, and then there'll be also ceiling coves as before with catwalks uh, for access. Pretty much all of these have catwalk system in the ceiling uh, where the technicians can uh, scurry back and forth. Uh, they call them catwalks, but quite often they're cat crawls because the limited ceiling space, they usually mean you have to go on your hands and knees, so they're not a lot of fun. Uh, one of the theaters I had, uh, we actually carpeted them. <laughs> so it wasn't so hard on the technician's knees. <clears throat> okay. And here's what one of those ceiling coves might look like. There's a catwalk and there'll be a hanging bar, uh, a pipe here, one of the half or two inch pipe. And the light fixtures are hung from there. And there'll be a, um, a wireway up here with outlets um, they are very similar today, even though we're using a DMX and uh, uh, controls and, and LED lights. Uh, they're very similar. They still have a, they still, you still have to connect them somehow. So they are plugged in. Uh, they're not doing this with Bluetooth yet. Um, and uh, the ceiling is below that. So the IES uh, in, in the, the handbook I referred to earlier, says the lighting of the uh, 
of the area is uh, the lighting for the audience area needs to provide several critical functions. The most important of these is circulation lighting in the seating aisle and stair areas for safety, obviously. Reading light for the attendees because they, whether they're looking at a program or a book or some other handout. Egress lighting under both normal and emergency conditions, which can be obviously very different and decorative lighting as required by the design team, accent lighting for revealing the architecture and work lights for cleaning, maintenance and production. So you end up in uh, all uh, performing art spaces with several different levels of lighting uh, in terms not only of the light level and how much brightness there is, but also the controls of it. Um, so for example, work lights right here, which will be used doing setup and cleaning maintenance and doing all that kind of thing. Those are usually completely separate and they're usually locked out during the performance. So nobody can accidentally turn them on. And some of you may have been in the theater and seen somebody accidentally turn the work lights on during a show. It's very disconcerting. Um, so all of these lights should be controlled by an architectural lighting system or a dedicated section of the performance lighting control system. This is, um, mostly done with this type of system. And the reason for that is the cost of running the performance lighting control system is significantly higher. So, cause of all of the dimmers and everything else involved. So it, it's usually an architectural lighting control system that controls everything except the stage lights. And there's an interface between the controls of those two systems. So that the guy in the control booth, shouldn't say guy, sorry, the technician in the control booth can uh, control uh, both types. So he can turn the house lights on and off. Um, in older theaters, uh, usually the stage manager has control of that and you'd have to ask the stage manager to uh, proceed with the, uh, with the house light control. <clears throat> so uh, this is just reiterating the former slide. So all house lighting must be controllable at the lobby level by the house manager, but also by the lighting operator in the control booth and optionally also by the stage manager. So the multiple levels of control for the same thing. There also must be emergency lighting provided in case of an accident or a power failure. And this is included in the building code. Um, building code will have a provision for a low level of light in the aisles during performance to accommodate patrons who need to leave during the performance or due to a medical emergency. So if you've never seen one, here's what a typical lighting console looks like now. Um, these are obviously all computerized. Uh, I, I came for out of the old old school camp. Uh, when I first started in theater, everything was manual. There was no automation controls uh, for for theater lighting. Um, and what there was was pretty, pretty primitive. Um, usually just multiple switches for the same or multiple sliders. These are called sliders. There would be multiple sliders for the same uh, dimmer and that you could control them in different ways for different what are called presets. So um, now it's all computerized. So now you can do practically anything. You can turn any light and there can be hundreds of them, any light on or off or dim it to any light level at any time during the performance. So everything is individually addressable and you can do them as groups. You can do, you basically have total control over that. Uh, used to be the only way you could do that was hardwired. So it was plug and cable and uh, quite complicated if you had very complex shows with lots and lots of cues. Dance shows were always the worst because, well, the most challenging, uh, also the most interesting uh, for a lighting designer um, because they would present the most challenges in terms of control. How do you, how do I do this? We did a show many years ago for the Toronto Dance Theater and their uh, lighting designer, who's a dear friend, um, had this series of cues of very, very close together, a fairly short piece, uh, maybe seven, eight minutes, um, but cue after cue after cue after cue after cue after cue after cue and lots of changes going on with replugging lights so that we could combine lights onto the same dimmers. Very confusing and difficult. We ran through the tech. We never actually got it right uh, until we did the, the day of the performance, the night of the performance, and we actually pulled it off. And the lighting designer said... <laughs> That's what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> and he told me afterwards, I, he said, I don't think we've ever been able to do that before. So I, I congratulated my crew because they did a great job. Um, very complicated. Now a lot easier uh, to accomplish complex cues. So here's, here's an example of a house lighting. Um, 
this is obviously a proscenium, a conventional proscenium stage where we have a uh, we have a curtain over here and a stage edge right here, an audience out front here. Um, as you can see, there are down lights located in the ceiling here. These these lines here would be where the coves are for the uh, stage lights. Uh, they also have a whole uh, rank of exposed stage lights along the edge of the balcony. Uh, this is something that has been done a fair bit. Is there's a there's an aesthetic reason for avoiding this, and it looks kind of clunky. Uh, that's that's part of the reason, but it's also very very practical because you can the lights are very easy to access. One of the problems with these is the audience can also access them. So somebody could lean over the balcony and hit the light or hang their coat over it or do something dopey. So uh, they are, uh, it's not the, it's not the preferred way of doing it. Um, but there's also ceiling coves up here. Um, you can also see there are wall lights mounted here, uh, wall sconces mounted, mounted here and underneath this balcony here uh, to give lots of light. And from this picture, you know, photos can be deceiving, but from this picture it appears that there's lots and lots of light in this, uh, in this theater. So here's a big, big auditorium. Um, as you can see, they've got two levels of balconies. You can see there's lots and lots of seats here. This has got to be several thousand seats in here. Um, and here's a control booth up here. Uh, it's usually uh, going to the control booth involves climbing. <laughs> um, and there'll be a, uh, usually a soundproof glass across here. And um, they're usually kept very dark because during the production, you don't want any light shining out of the windows. And the light and sound operators and the follow spot operators will all be located in this space. So let's go back and talk a little bit about lighting basics because some of this is going to apply to your project, especially in terms of the, those three words that we were trying to achieve um, in our project. So, um, the spectrum of light source has been the most difficult thing to control. Um, light color, up until the uh, advent of the LEDs, um, light color was basically what you got. So um, most commercial, industrial, industrial, and institutional facilities use single color temperature source throughout with rare exemptions. So except, for example, in a hospital, they typically use 4,100 Kelvin. Um, that's what used to be called cool white. So it's a fairly cool um, color. CCT refers to um, correlated color temperature. It's the, it's the metric for the color of the light source. So what is the color of the light that comes from the source? And this is over quite a wide range and I'll show you some of those ranges in a moment. So why would we wanna change the source color? Well, one argument for controlling light spectrum to suit human response is the amenity curve. And a more compelling reason is the link between the light spectrum and our circadian rhythm. Let's take a look, first of all, at the amenity curve. This is a fairly, um, an, an older uh, look at the relationship between uh, what, uh, what we see or how well we see under different lighting conditions. So this is the brightness, the luminance, how bright is the surface? And this is the color temperature. And the color temperature down here, there's tungsten halogen right here. Okay, now remember I said that our office lighting and school lighting right now, uh, typically in about the 300 to 350 range, that means it's gonna be right in here. Okay, so if we draw a line across from here, now that means that we don't want to use any light fixture that is, uh, has got a higher color temperature than 4,000. So if I take about 300 here and draw a line straight across, and right about here, I'm gonna be hitting around 4,000. So around 4,000 Kelvin is sort of the magic number. We don't want to go higher than that because we're gonna be outside of the amenity curve. What happens if you're outside the amenity curve? So what happens if we have something that's uh, 300 Kelvin and we're 5,000? Well, we're right in here somewhere, okay? Now, what happens when you do that? When you do that, uh, color perception is not accurate. Uh, our human vision system can't accommodate that. So what happens is things look like they're grayed out. They look like the, the, the reds and the colors like that sort of tend to disappear if you were in this range, for example. 
If you were in this range, it would be the opposite. The reds and colors like that would be oversaturated. The blues would disappear. So um, the, the you ignore the Krutov curve at your peril because it is a really good indicator of um, how well people are going to be able to see in a space. The uh, the danger, the, the, the reason this has become more important, even more critical now, is now that we can adjust the color and that the advent of LEDs has meant that there's an, been much more emphasis on much cooler color temperatures. And there's a very, there's a very simple reason for that. Um, there's no really such thing as a white light LED. A white light LED is actually a blue light LED that's got phosphors on it to make it look more yellow or more white. The problem is the more phosphor you put on, the less efficient the light source becomes and the shorter it lives. So the LED manufacturers are very motivated to have us have light uh, color temperatures that are up in here. The problem is that if we have fairly low light levels, this is not going to work for us. So our vision system will take, could take a thousand years for our vision system to adapt to a different light source. And it's very, very slow adaptation in human vision systems. So um, this is this is very problematic at the moment and we're seeing a lot of it. Now, the other reason that we're concerned about light color is because of human circadian rhythm. Um, humans have a very, uh, um, clear rhythm in our in our day. Uh, this is from Lighting Manufacturer magazine. It's just a very neat little graphic and it shows us our range. Now, the only range we're really concerned about is our theater, right? So our theater, I, I don't know of any theater that does productions in the morning. There's cinemas they do, they show movies, but not that many. But most people go to the theater for an afternoon for a matinee or for an evening performance. So we're in this range right here. And this is where we're in the warmer color range. So typically we're, this is daytime out here, obviously in the afternoon, if we're going to a two o'clock uh, matinee, um, it's the time of our best coordination and fastest reaction time. All that sort of stuff happens prior to dinner. And then after, when we get into the uh, uh, six to uh, six to uh, seven range, now we're in the area where our systems are starting to slow down and we definitely want warmer colors, okay? Has to do with melatonin secretion, and uh, the 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 colors we the color that our eyes uh, or our bodies require physiologically are warmer colors, not cooler colors. So that why that's why one of the reasons that theater we looked at earlier with really really warm colors that's probably the better, the right target to shoot for for a performance space. So arrival of LEDs has introduced the potential for dynamically controlling the color of light in the space relatively easily. These systems consist of a sensor, an LED light fixture with a driver, which is not only dimmable, but also able to, able to control multiple LEDs within a single luminaire. So the color temperature of the fixture can be adjusted. These systems are usually called tunable white LED lighting systems and proprietary systems are available now. It has the potential to improve productivity, learning and well-being. So the obvious applications are commercial building schools and healthcare. But I would also say that an argument could be made for a theater uh, performance space because human health is involved. So light source color. So the appropriate color is uh, really critical um, to perceive quality. And we have subjective impressions based on our previous expe uh, experience. So the appropriate change of source spectrum impacts not only our impression of the space, but also our circadian rhythms. So this has led to a lot of confusion in the industry. There's often conflicting recommendations. Uh, there's conflicting recommendations right now about the color temperature of roadway lights. So this is largely driven by the proven deleterious effects of excessive blue wavelength light on circadian rhythms and our well-being. And this has been this has been scientifically proven. We know this is true. Um, the studies that were done with uh, nurses that work uh, 12 hour shifts day and night and uh, with the more blue light sources, uh, this definitely has a bad effect on their health. So here's an example of being able to change the light color. So if you can see in this space, they've actually uh, controlled the light um, uh, in, in the room in two halves. On the on the seated the seating side, we have a very cool appearance, so high color temperature, so 4,000 Kelvin or more. And on the left, we have a much warmer 
you know, 20, 2,700, 2,800, 3,000 uh, 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 Kelvin color temperature. Uh oh, here comes something. Ooh, hope you got your pencil ready. Ooh. So what is human centric lighting? Lighting that considers both the visual and non-visual effects of exposing humans to light and that widens the range of possible effects from visual performance and comfort to sleep quality, alertness, mood and behavior with with mood and with and behavior with consequences for human health, learning and spending. And this has got a lot of interest uh, on the commercial sector, of course, because you know uh, we've been doing this for years. Um, if you didn't know, in the grocery section of the uh, or in any section of, of a grocery store, the light colors that are used are there to augment the appearance of the food and the, and the, the packaged items. So uh, the meat section, for example, uses uh, lights that are high in the red spectrum because obviously you want the meat to look red and fresh. Uh, vegetables, there's lots of green and yellow because you want them to look great. So yeah, it's uh, this has been going on for a time. Now it's becoming easier to control that. So human-centric or circadian lighting is lighting that responds to human circadian rhythms, and it uses sensors, timers, dimming controllers, and color tuning capability of LEDs to adjust lighting color and intensity either automatically or in response to human input. Those studies have shown these systems, when properly implemented, can contribute to the well-being well of uh, building options, uh, building occupants. Now, lighting quality is a goal of our project. This would be a good starting point for lighting designers when considering the public areas and the artist areas, such as the dressing rooms and the green room uh, for our performing arts center. So here's a map of what integrative lighting looks like. Um, this was sourced from the, uh, from the National Research uh, Council. So if you look at how uh, our, our visual system works, we have light that we're reacting to, and there's two reactions. There's an image forming platform pathway, that is what am I seeing? And there's the non-image forming platform pathway, and that is how is it affecting me, okay? So in terms of the image forming, there's visual performance, there's visual experience and visual comfort. So in other words, how well do I see it? How do I react to it? And what is the comfort range? In other words, how much glare is there? What's the color? Those kinds of things that are going to affect the comfort. On the other side, we have this non-image forming pathway, and that is circadian effects, which we've already talked about, and acute effects, which are ones that affect a small portion of the population. Um, for example, people who are epileptic will react to certain frequencies of, of light operation. And this is actually an impact right now with LEDs because they operate at much lower frequencies than our conventional lighting fixtures did. And all these things combined affect our behavior, our physiology, our health, our well-being. Now, this graph really nicely summarizes that whole relationship. So light for life is another term. So we have, uh, this is also sourced from NRC. Do we have uh, light levels for vision and well-being? We have uh, luminance distributions and individual control. We have to demonstrate value, spectral tuning, temporal light modulation, windows, daylight and view and sustainability. So there's a whole bunch of factors here. You can look these up online. They're all well explained. Um, I don't have time now, but the um, light for life is not just about how much light is there. It's a whole um, uh, menu, if you will, of different, uh, different approaches to lighting design. 
Uh, Lord Kelvin said, when you measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. So one of the things our building systems now, our lighting systems now enable us to do are things like asset management, where we can store all the information about the products that we're using, how often they've been maintained, when was the light source changed most recently, all this kind of information uh, can be done to give us diagnostic information, energy and power reporting and standards for asset management. So all this stuff can be done now with the control systems in our um, in our buildings. So I'd like to wind up with this um, with this slide. Uh, this is uh, this is also sourced from the NRC. Although this graph initial, I, I, I believe this came from the Illuminating Engineering Society initially. Um, there's this relationship between uh, the individual well-being, the economics, and the architecture. Um, if we design to one thing only, in other words, if we focus entirely on lowest first cost, lowest operating cost, all those kinds of economics-driven decisions, then this will suffer because we haven't included the factors that ensure the individual well-being of the people, the users in the space. And also we've ignored the architecture. So we've thrown the beauty out. So it's very easy to design or relatively easy to design and specify projects only following one of these three. This is the easiest one to follow. And it's the one that has the most impact economically. So this is the one that gets all the attention. The danger is that we lose this. So we lose the beauty. We lose the wow factor when we walk into the building. And we also lose the health and, and well-being of our users in our, in our space. So it's really a team sport, uh, integrating electric light, daylight for best effects. So integrated design teams and best use of sources and controls have never been more important. And why is that the case? Because we've never had the choices we have today. Uh, I'd like to wind up with uh, some slides just showing some typical spaces. Uh, if you haven't seen these spaces, um, you, if you're in Toronto, you've got no excuse. You've got to go see them. They're, they're, they're really great spaces to see. Uh, they're really great spaces to see great concerts in. Um, uh, there's a few of these that are, that are music, uh, primarily music uh, and recital halls. Uh, this is Massey. This is the grandfather uh, recently had. Um, uh, a long, long overdue uh, refresh. And uh, one of the things they did that just <clears throat> touched my heart was these beautiful windows were, uh, they're all leaded glass. Uh, they were all custom made uh, when the place was built in the late 1800s. And um, they were all covered in plywood for the last 40 years. So uh, they were all opened up, they were all restored and it's just beautiful. Lovely, lovely theater. Uh, try to avoid sitting right up here. The acoustics are great. Uh, second balcony and the ground level are the best, but um, the uh, it's uh, I've seen some great performances here. Uh, this is Kerner Hall. So this is a completely modern take on a, on a, on a music hall, a recital hall. Uh, this is the one at the Royal Conservatory of Music, uh, right behind the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, spectacular ac acoustics and uh, a really, really stunning space. Um, uh, these uh, fixtures were all custom. Uh, these were designed uh, by um, Suzanne Powatic, a well-known Canadian lighting designer, and uh, seen a lot of good concerts there too. And this is the Elgin Theatre, um, best known for um, Phantom of the Opera. Uh, once again, old style proscenium arch, uh, very traditional. Um, a lot more curve to it than you find in the typical theater. Like Massey Hall doesn't have this much curve to it, but uh, um, beautiful space and beautifully restored. Real gold up here, by the way, gold leaf light up there. I was there when they were doing it, it was spectacular. And this is the Winter Garden, which is upstairs and behind the Elgin. And if you have a chance to see a concert here or see a performance here, this is fantastical. It's, it looks like something that comes from Disney. This whole ceiling, consists of like a garden. It's like a hanging garden with plants hanging down. They're all artificial, um, but they're, it's all greenery hanging down from the ceiling, as you can see around this archway here. And it's quite spectacular. It's just like something, like I say, it's like something out of a fantasy. Um, some resources here. Uh, these uh, slides will be provided, so you don't have to copy these down. Um, but there's a few things that we'll do here. And uh, I think that wraps it up. Any questions? 
Well, thank you, Jerry. Um, I, I, this is Adam here, everyone. Uh, I'm not going to turn on my camera. We'll just keep Jerry as the star of the show. Um, if you have any questions, I think you should be able to open up your mic um, and just jump in and feel free to ask a question. I'm just going to check and make sure that I, I think that's, if not, put a message in the chat. Um, if, if you have any questions, I have one question for you. First of all, um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with your um, all of your selections there. They're all beautiful theaters. Um, I would hate to be the one in charge of dusting the Winter Garden, um, all those <laughs> leaves. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, beautiful, beautiful places. Yeah. The, um, so what, I have a question here, um, and then we'll see if anyone else comes up with any. So go ahead. It's, yeah, go uh, ahead. You got a, a question? OK. So. Uh, okay, so it should be obvious to everyone by now that theater lighting is incredibly complex um, and has to be able to respond to all sorts of different performance demands. Um, and you talked a lot about uh, the technological change and um, the, obviously the, the impact of LEDs is huge and they all introduce new challenges. So I'm wondering if there's anything that you can um, that you would recommend at this stage of the building, someone's putting together a theater right now, um, what are the things they can do to be ready for any future technological changes. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll have to gaze into my crystal ball here and see what uh, what I can come up with. Um, the, uh, the lighting industry in the last 20 years has gone through more change than in the previous 100 years. So um, the let me give you an example. Everybody knows what a fluorescent lamp looks like. Anybody who went to school or has been in a hospital or been in any public building, you've seen rows and rows and rows and rows of fluorescent fixtures in the mar and, and the ceilings, right? They came into place in the late 30s and started to get more and more use through the 40s. And by the and, and it wasn't until 1990 that there was a change in that technology. So in other words, there was 50 years of that technology before there was a significant change. And that's when we went to the T8, which was the smaller diameter lamp, which was significantly more efficient, 30 or 40%. So way more efficient than the old technology. And we did a lot of work in the 90s changing those. So it took that long for that technology to get uh, improved, uh, dramatically improved. Now, what was happening with LEDs? Well, um, we moved into our house 10 years ago and I redid all the lighting, of course, because I'm a lighting designer. Um, but there were some uh, task lighting under the under the counters, and I used fluorescent. Why did I use fluorescent? But because ten years ago there was no white light LED that was really a good color, and dimmable, and available in a size that I needed for underneath my counters. Now, ten years later, you can't find a fluorescent one that does that. You're like the the LED ones are everywhere. You can buy them at the home hardware. So. The technology has changed. Uh, the technology change is very, very quick. The the uh, entire infrastructure that supports that, in terms of the regu regulatory structure and also the um, the institutional structure, like the Illuminating Engineering Society, those organizations work very, very slowly. So we're way behind on the uh, on every, the tools we need. Uh, to work really efficiently with these with these with these uh, these technologies, and not only that, um, they are uh, changing as we speak. So, I mean, there's OLEDs coming online. There's uh, there's talk of a, uh, um, I believe, at the Berkeley uh, in California, uh, they took an incandescent bulb, they threw a bunch of engineers at it and physicists, and said, okay, make this really efficient, and they they produced a light source that was 200 lumens per watt, which is what twice any LEDs right now, so uh, twice as efficient. So, you know, this 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 game is not over. So uh, all I can do uh, suggest to people is stay awake and stay alert because it's it's changing, you know, by the minute. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, and, and then call you, I guess. Yeah, 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 no, no, please. I'm supposed to be retired. So <laughs> I keep telling myself, I keep telling myself that. <laughs> um, 
there's got to there's got to be a joke about retiring and and dinning and there's something in there. There's something in there. Yeah, you don't. Uh, yeah, old lighting designers that uh, uh, old lighting designers don't retire. They just fade to, fade to zero. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I don't see any of their questions in the chat. Does any of the um, any of our uh, students, anyone have any um, questions for Jerry? If not, uh, we're just the other. Just the other thing I should mention, Adam, is that is that, um, and I, I probably didn't make this obvious enough. Um, and on projects like this, there would be a theater consultant, and the theater consultant would have his lighting engineer, and those guys are the guys that know. Um, you know, how the late, what the latest stuff is. Uh, that's their job is to stay on top of it. Um, they, uh, they would be doing stuff like if there's a flying system that allows, uh, you know, set pieces to come in and out in theater, which they normally would, they would know uh, all about that. Um, moving stuff backstage nowadays is done with air. Uh, we used to do great big casters, big wheels to move things around. Now that's all done with, most of it's done with air, but they, they, all that stuff floats on a cushion of air. Um, so Very there's all kinds of technologies that are, that have changed uh, fairly dramatically over the last 20 years. And all of that has, is, has to have infrastructure backstage. If you're going to have stuff that's carried around on air, that means you have to have a big compressor and you have to have a big compressor that nobody right. can hear. <laughs> right. So uh, I was, I was just going to say that any, any, uh, any sort of system that uses pneumatics is going to be allowed somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they have, uh, they have uh, um, like a, usually uh, with any of these buildings, they'll have a generator vault and the generator vault is usually located separate from the building or, but adjacent to it, but outside. So that if you do hear a noise, it's going to, you have to be outside to hear it. Uh, lots and lots of concrete in between, um, and uh, to keep the keep the noise down. Yeah. Well, that's certainly a good little um, uh, secret design thing right there. So that's something at this point of the building. If we're you know we're just at the very beginning of conceptualizing it, we already know that it's likely we need a spot uh, attached to the building on the property, but exterior uh, for for these this type of equipment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's uh, there's all kinds of uh, access issues. You know, you have to think about how do people get into the flies, uh, into the catwalks and the ceiling? How do they get there? Um, right. You're going to have to have ladder system. Um, it's usually, there's usually a, a, fa a false wall between the, uh, what looks like the inside wall of the theater. If you're, if you're in the audience and you see the wall there, there's another wall beyond that. And in that space, there's a tech access space where technical uh, types can, they have ladders and they have storage areas for all the lights and various things so that they can, uh, they can do all that business um, and have all that stuff uh, available to them. Um, storage spaces, uh, wardrobe storage spaces, for example. Um, St. Lawrence Center is generally uh, a lot of uh, touring shows come in. Uh, with touring shows, you have to have a large power supply so they can bring quite often they'll bring in their own equipment right um, if you're touring a big complex show you don't want to have to use an in-house system that doesn't have enough dimmer capability or doesn't have enough power capability so you'll bring your own stuff in that's why if you right. go to a Even show like pre-programming things is a big thing with touring exactly shows, right? you'll bring in your board it's pre-programmed you drop it in connect everything Good exactly yeah yeah that's why when then with a big musical show for example or, or a touring rock band you'll see the trucks back back behind the theater behind the space and those trucks not only house you know the, the uh, for transporting stuff they also house the controls and, and various other things that they just plug them in so they don't have to haul the stuff into the theater it's just located nearby uh you'll see that also with shows that are uh, that are remote where they have a, they actually have their own generator um so yeah that they're, they're all of the stuff is um access stage access for transport trucks so they can you know get stuff in and out quickly and easily all those things are are uh, are things you need to think about when you're doing performing art spaces. Great, lots of great insights there, and, Jerry. And Thank don't you. forget the caterer. I, and don't forget the caterer, the most important of all services. <laughs> Uh, I think we have to wrap up here. We're just out of time. So, Jerry, thank you again. This has been really quite an enlightening presentation. Um, we hope to see you. I'm not sure if you're at the workshop tomorrow, but if so, we'll see you there. And if not, we'll see you again soon. Take care, Adam. Thanks for, uh, thanks for hosting. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jerry. Take care.